Chancellor Nordenberg, dear Mark, Mayor, professors, ladies and uh, gentlemen, it is uh, with a deep sense of honor that I receive this honorary doctoral of uh, public and international affairs degree from this most distinguished university. Be assured of my heartfelt appreciation. And thank you, Mr. Chancellor, for your warm words. I had the impression to attend my funeral. <laughs> <laughs> and as, I, as a Prime Minister, you have to designate the one who, if the event I'm speaking of is to happen, will take the floor. I have found the one I needed. <laughs> Visiting today your university is first and foremost visiting old friends. It is now nearly 10 years ago that together with Luke Frieden, my Minister of uh, Justice, I first came to this uh, prestigious institution. Back then, the European Union Centre stood only at its beginning, but was already full of promise. I am more than pleased with the impressive development that has taken place since, the centre becoming one in only 10 European Union centres of excellence in the US designated and supported by the European Commission. I have since uh, 99 met on a regular basis with Chancellor Nuremberg and other distinguished representatives of Pitt. It was my privilege to both observe and support the development of an intense and fruitful collaboration between the University of Pittsburgh and uh, Luxembourg. My sympathy for this university is, however, not only linked to its academic excellence. It has also to do with the city that has given it its name. I have grown up in Luxembourg in the shadows of blast furnaces at a time when the steel industry was at its peak. The steel mills did not only dominate the landscape, they also set the rhythm of life for the people in the south of Luxembourg. To this day, the honest and hard physical work of proud people like my father serves as a role model to me. As a young adult, it was no longer the might of the blast furnaces, but to the contrary, the fragility that marked my life and the lives of so many people in Luxembourg. In quite a few places in the world, be it in Europe or in the United States, I would probably have to go into more detail to make the audience fully appreciate the devastating effects of the steel crisis of the 70s and the 80s on a country like Luxembourg, of which it was once said that it was a gift of steel like Egypt was a gift of the Nile. In Pittsburgh, in Steel City, I know that I am being understood even without elaborating further. Both Pittsburgh and Luxembourg have gone through the same pains. Both have also succeeded in emerging from the crisis stronger than they have ever been. They have embraced new ideas, new industries, new ambitions, new areas of development, but without turning their back on their past. And just like the tower of US steel continues to dominate the skyline of Pittsburgh, Luxembourg is today the host of the world's largest steel company, ArcelorMittal. For me, being the honored guest of the University of Pittsburgh does therefore not only mean being with friends, but also feeling a bit like home. Ladies and gentlemen, my topic for today is the European Union, more precisely its current state, its future, as well as its role on the world stage. In my last speech in Pittsburgh, in September 1999, I concluded my address by announcing that upon my return to Europe, negotiations on a new treaty 
to prepare the EU institutions for the forthcoming enlargement to the former communist Central European nations would start, and I made the hazardous prediction that we would be able to wrap up this work rapidly. Then, after having accomplished this good deed, the European Union could finally start focusing again on policies rather than treaties. But European history, culture, politics imply that we like doing things the hard way. <laughs> so nine years on, we have traveled a fair distance, but we have still not gone full circle. Yes, there was a new treaty in the year 2000, the so-called Treaty of Nice, but the negotiations leading to it have been among the most divisive in the history of the European Union. And all that for a result that was far from convincing. This explains why, as early as 2001, the European Union launched the process that was supposed to finally give the European Union the institutions and rules to allow it to firmly establish itself as an efficient and effective actor on the world stage. We tried to innovate by gathering the so-called convention, bringing together members of parliament, other elected politicians rather than diplomats and foreign ministers, as it is the case in the traditional intergovernmental conferences. But even though some of the convention felt like being in Philadelphia in 1787, the result did not quite produce the same enthusiasm than the work of the founding father of the United States had more than two centuries earlier. The Constitutional Treaty that finally emerged in 2004 from the workings of the Convention and the ensuing Intergovernmental Conference was rejected in 2005 by referendum in both France and the Netherlands. As acting president of the European Council during the first semester of 2005, it was my rather doubtful privilege to present the official reaction of the European Union to the French non and the Dutch ne. I will never forget it. The French and the Dutch have forgotten since then. <laughs> the negative outcome of the two referenda implied that Europe withdrew onto itself, trying to sort out the instit institutional mess that it had created, rather than tackling head on many failed threats and challenges that the world was confronted with, including the emergence of new security threats and the acceleration of globalization. At last, in December 2007, we signed a new and leaner treaty, the Lisbon Treaty. And so, hopefully, the year 2008 will finally bring to a successful end a rather painful process that started as early as the year uh, 2000. I'm not really enlightened by this. Uh... <laughs> now when it comes to, to European matters, matters where I should be enlightened, I would call myself a realist. It is my inner conviction that the rejection of the Constitutional Treaty by two founding nations, France, Netherlands, cannot be cast aside as a simple historical accident. I am convinced that it translates a deeper malaise or even disenchantment with the European project as we conceived it. In fact, I firmly believe that the French no and the Dutch ne were the expression of a deep European crisis, a crisis whose basic characteristics can be found in every European country, a crisis that turns back further than the debates surrounding the Constitution, and therefore a crisis that European leaders would be well advised not to forget, just because the Lisbon Treaty will hopefully have come into force. The European Union has always been confronted with the fact that some Europeans are demanding more Europe, while others considered 
from quite early on in the process that there is already too much Europe. What is new is that it appears today that both camps are about equal strength. And as the referenda in France and the Netherlands have proven, the particular prevailing national context of the moment can easily bring the too much Europe already camp into the majority. Even in Luxembourg, a nation that has been frequently identif identified as one as, as the most EU-friendly in Europe, it proved to be a hard piece of work to finally convince a majority to support the treaty in our own July 05 referendum. Now, outside the European Union, one might be surprised by this assessment. All around the world, Europe is admired for having succeeded to overcome centuries of wars between its major nations in order to become a haven of peace and stability. After World War II, the European project has developed by our own founding fathers, the likes of Schumann, Monet, Adenauer, Spark, Besch, has rallied the arch enemies France and Germany behind a common goal. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, the European project has been a common objective of all the Central and Eastern European nations, thereby finally achieving the reconciliation of European history with European geography. Europe is admired for its economic successes. The single European market is today the single most important economic area of the world, with more than 450 million consumers. The undeniable success of the single currency, the euro, is recognized all over the world, while in the European Union itself, it is mostly self-doubt that prevails. And even the deep respect earned by the European Union and its member states as the most important donors of development aid in the world seems to pass unnoticed. One of the reasons for this lack of self-confidence and pride in our own achievements is to be found with people like myself, the leaders of the European nations. The European Union is supposed to be a tool to advance the common good in Europe. But in political debates, it is mostly us and them. If a European decision is popular, governments, prime ministers, ministers will claim them for themselves. <clears throat> if it proves unpopular, it will all be the fault of Brussels. You may find this hard to believe, but mentioning Brussels in Europe is even more unpopular than mentioning Washington in the US. <laughs> when a compromise is found on a contentious topic, one could hope that it would be greeted with at least some enthusiasm, but no rather than congratulating ourselves on reaching agreement, we have developed an acquired taste for self-destruction by trying to pick the winners and the losers of every agreement, thus planting the seeds of future disagreements. So, during six days of the week, the leaders of European nations are quite happy to declare that the European bright is neither smart nor good-looking, bears only costs, and brings no advantage. And on Sunday, they try to convince their voters to propose to this very same right. Maybe we shouldn't be surprised if they prefer to abstain from time to time. We should therefore be prepared to do the lesson from the fiasco of the Constitutional Treaty. The lesson is that the European project flourishes if we accentuate our semblances and deride our differences, and that it flounders if we accentuate our differences and deride our semblances. Ladies and gentlemen, for all its complex inner workings over the past decade, it is obviously not the case that the European Union has been completely absent from the international debate. But it is time for Europe to return to center stage and focus no longer on how to do, but on what to do. 
With the Lisbon Treaty, the European Union gives itself better tools to push its agenda and to realize its ambition on the international scheme. The European Council of Heads of State and Government will be shared by a permanent president rather than the traditional rotation every six months. Thus, if you want to call Europe at 3 a.m., you will know which number to dial and you will know who will pick up the phone. The European Union will finally have its foreign minister, who in true EU fashion is not allowed to bear that easily understandable title, but has to go on under the one of high representative of foreign affairs. The new high representative will combine the jobs of the current high representative for common foreign and security policy and the commissioner for external relations. He or she will thereby not only gain access to the budgetary means of the European Commission, but also be able to develop a fully-fledged diplomatic service at the European level. The European Union will continue to take a leading role on, in the debate on climate change. Europe has been at the forefront of this topic for over a decade. There was a lot of doubt in the beginning, but as we have witnessed with the development of the debate here in the US, the worldwide consensus that climate change is one of the major challenges to our generation is near complete. The European Union is engaging very actively in the so-called post-Kyoto debate. Our goal is to conclude the current round of talks in December 2009 in Copenhagen, Denmark, with a comprehensive, ambitious and effective international agreement on the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. I do sincerely hope that the United States will join the European Union in this effort in response to a challenge that knows neither national nor continental borders. On this, like on other issues, we have to work together, we, the US and the European Union. The single most important and most trusted partner of the European Union has been, is and will be the United States of America. We are more than just friends. We are partners, friends, if not family. And yes, like in all families, we have our disagreements and more difficult times to overcome. But friends, we remain all the same. The transatlantic relations cannot be analyzed solely on a day-to-day -day basis. They have first and foremost to be set into their broader context. The link between the United States and Europe is one a friendship, of course, but also of blood. Europe will never forget that it owes America its liberty and freedom. Coming from a small country of which large parts were the theater of the Battle of the Bulge, you can trust me that these are not empty words. Beyond these very emotional links, our diplomatic and political relations remain the bedrock of the international community, while our trade relations dominate the world economy. In short, be it in political, security, or economic terms, the transatlantic relationship is irreplaceable. The fact that President Bush chose Brussels as the destination for his first international visit after the inauguration of his second term is in this respect highly revealing. He was in February 2005 the very first American president to visit not individual European countries but the institutions of the European Union as such. For having chaired the meeting between President Bush and the heads of state and government of the then 25 member states, I can assure you that it became, as so often in our history, very clear to all participants that if Americans and Europeans stand together, they are an irresistib irresistible force that even 
in an increasingly multipolar world still makes a difference. So yes, we did go through a difficult moment in our relationship with the debate about the Iraq war. But the basic reasons for our friendship remain fully intact. I am therefore quite optimistic that no matter who will be the next president, and as it seems, Pennsylvania is prepared to offer as quite a showdown in this respect in a bit over a week's time, the transatlantic relationship will remain a cornerstone of both the American and the European foreign policies. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention. Thank you once more for the honor I'm giving today. It fills me with pride. Thank you. The Prime Minister has kindly agreed to respond to a few questions before we get him back to Washington. Uh, presiding at this portion of the program will be Professor Alberta Subraja, the director of our European Union Center of Excellence. Good afternoon. After such a wonderful speech, I'm sure that we have plenty of questions. Let me just ask uh, each questioner to identify themselves. If they're a student, to please indicate whether they're a graduate student or an undergraduate student and at which university uh, they're enrolled, just so that the Prime Minister gets an idea of whom, uh, to whom he is speaking. All right, we're ready for the first question. Thank you very much. My name's Heather McKibben. I'm a PhD student at the University of Pittsburgh. I know that you have participated in negotiations in both the European Council as Prime Minister as well as in the Council of Ministers. Could you talk a little bit about how the interactions and negotiations you have experienced in these two different institutions differ? The uh, work we are delivering in this so-called specialized council formation is by far more serious than the one which is delivered at the level of the European a council. For me, this is not a real problem. As a finance minister, I'm participating in the proceedings of the so-called ECOFIN Council, and then I have to change the room in order to discover my fellow colleagues, uh, prime minister. They don't have the same knowledge on the legislative details than ministers are supposed to have and normally uh, do have. So it's more atmospheric. The European Council, the Prime Ministers, they are not proceeding to a legislative work. They are discussing issues, they are trying to, to uh, give some impetus to the initiatives taken by the Commission or themselves. In order to give a short answer to a short question, Ministers are more serious than Prime Minister. That's the reason why I stayed as a Finance Minister too. <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, could we quote that in some of our publications? <laughs> if you would indicate that I didn't point with my finger at any uh, <laughs> identifiable uh, European uh, government, you, you've just I helped could agree. To quite a few dissertations. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. Good afternoon. My name is Cole Harvey. I'm an undergraduate here at Pitt. Uh, the Financial Times reported in February that the Council of Ministers had issued a statement supporting eventual EU membership for both Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, how do you envision that process unfolding given Serbia's uh, very strong opposition to an independent Kosovo? I don't think that Kosovo can be presented as a hurdle or an obstacle to an invitation to be given to Serbia to join uh, the European Union. I know that we have in all our countries a more than pronounced enlargement fatigue and that our public opinions are not really willing to support further, further enlargements. But you have to know that the situation in the Western Balkans is a very 
complicated, dramatic and tragic one. If we don't offer to these countries, to Croatia, to Serbia, to Bosnia and Herzegovina, to Macedonia, to others, Montenegro, a European perspective, where will we invest these uh, countries? We had a European war 10 years ago in Kosovo, the first European war we had since World War II. And these demons, they have not been drifted away. They are still there, they are sleeping. So these countries do need a European perspective. And the fact that Serbia, for to some extent understandable historical reason, was not able to recognize uh, the new state Kosovo is not an obstacle to an invitation to be given to Serbia because other member states of the European Union, Spain, Greece, Malta, Cyprus, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, didn't recognize uh, Kosovo. So this is a problem, but not an obstacle. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. I am Niv Nivi Prabhakran, and I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Pittsburgh. Last week in, in the Financial Times, you were quoted in an article about the EU finance ministers calling on governments and unions to not bargain for an inflationary wage rate. Do you see people heeding this call given the ECB's recent unpopularity? And if there is such a great con concern about the inflation, do you see the European Central Bank increasing the interest rate if inflation keeps increasing despite the growing, slowing growth? I don't like the enthusiasm with what you are reading the Financial Times. <laughs> there are other newspapers in, in Europe, even written in Shakespeare's language, which have at least the same amount of deep knowledge on European affairs than the more oriented views coming from the other side of the channel. But I have to accept that uh, the reputation of the Financial Times in the US is uh, exactly the same than the one of the Wall Street Journal in Europe. And my information on the US, I'm not picking them up in the Wall Street Journal, but uh, <laughs> If the ambassador would not be there, I would say in, in the reports of our embassy, but that's not true, and so uh, I don't want to insist, uh, insist on that point. What I said the other uh, Saturday, I think, or Friday in uh, Slovenia during the informal uh, ECOFIN uh, Eurogroup meeting was that the European Central Bank is not the only institution which uh, is in charge of uh, fighting against inflation and, the, uh, and is in charge of uh, uh, price stability. The European Central Bank has as a main objective provided by the Maastricht Treaty uh, to maintain price stability and has to deliver that job in full uh, independence uh, as regards uh, possible uh, influences of, uh, of governments and other political uh, bodies. We have reached a level of inflation, a rate of inflation of 3.5. 3 That's the highest figure we have reached in the last 16 years. Less high than the inflation rate in the US, but too high uh, for, to, to European uh, uh, standards. We have to bring this inflation down, because inflation is the enemy of those uh, who are members of the low income uh, categories. It's the enemy of those who are poor. If you are rich, if you are a millionaire, if you are a billionaire, you don't have a problem if the price of tomatoes is increasing. But those earning 200, 300, 400 euros or dollars, they have a problem. Inflation is hitting them in a totally different manner than inflation is hitting those who don't have uh, revenue or income problems. The U European unions have to understand that nevertheless wage moderation is of paramount uh, importance because if wage increases are not developing in line with productivity progress, these exaggerated wage increases are adding to the inflationary problem we do have and are adding as a final result to the difficulties of life of those who have less chances than those who have all chances. That's the reason why I was saying that the fight against inflation is part of social policy and that all of us, we should be aware that uh, this is a uh, serious matter 
governments, central bankers, and unions. Okay, thank you. Next question. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Kate Floros. I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science here at the University of Pittsburgh, and my question is not based on a Financial Times article. <laughs> uh, the EU is an institution with both large and small states. As the leader of a small state, can you discuss the pros and cons of leadership being shared equally among such diverse countries? I was just asking in a language namely Luxembourg, which is less known to you than English to us, if I have understood correctly your uh, question, and I did. Okay. When Winston Churchill gave his famous uh, speech in Zurich in '46, he was saying that the specific dimension of the European project uh, he was uh, heading at was that small and great nations having the same dignity should work and cooperate closely together if the, as if there were no size, no difference in size between great and smaller uh, member states. The smaller member, the, the smaller nations in Europe applauded immediately because they understood perfectly well that this was the last time that this was said by British Prime Minister. <laughs> The greater said, yes, okay, we agree, because this is the continental genius of uh, the Europeans, to accept that there is a difference in size, but there is no difference in dignity. I myself, I must say, that I never thought that smaller member states of the European Union should behave as if they were the greatest powers of the world. And I strongly believe that the greater member states of the European Union should not behave as if they were amongst the greatest nations of the world. And anyway, I do consider that we don't have great countries and great states in Europe. Not a single European nation can develop a stand-alone uh, policy. Not a single nation. I don't have the feeling, as representative of a small member state, to have no say in the European Union. We are sitting around the table where the main decisions are taken concerning the place we are living in. We were experiencing, as a small country, centuries and decades where others decided what our fate, our thought, our future should be, and where nobody asked our advice. Now we are sitting there where things, European things are brought together and are decided uh, collectively. And the fact that a European state is belonging to the European Union gives this European state a profile and an international dimension this state would never have without the membership of the European Union. I was discussing yesterday night 80 minutes with the President of the US. Do you really think if Luxembourg were not a member of the European Union that he would listen 80 minutes to the Prime Minister of a country of 400,000 people? He would never do so. Do you think he would listen to Britain in the way he has to listen to Britain? If Britain uh, had decided to stand away from the European Union, do you really think he would listen to Belgium, to the Netherlands, to Spain, to Austria in the way he has to listen to these countries if these countries were not members of the European Union? So I don't think that this is a real dividing line in the European Union. It's about equal dignity. And equal dignity provides you with equal, with equal influence, at, la at least in principle. Thank you, sir. Can we quote that in our dissertation yes. as well? Thank you. Next question, please. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you for coming today. Um, my name is Ken Lynch. I'm an undergraduate here at Pitt. Last week at the NATO summit, Croatia and Albania were extended an offer of membership, and despite President Bush's support, Georgia and Ukraine were not extended the same offer. Do you view this enlargement of NATO as a positive thing for Luxembourg and Europe? And if so, how do you answer the claims that 
it unnecessarily antagonizes and isolates Russia from the European Atlantic community? I think that uh, the different uh, enlargement waves uh, we went through since 97 as far as uh, the Northern Atlantic Alliance is concerned are in the best interest of the existing members of, the, of, of uh, NATO and of uh, the uh, states which were invited so far. We have extended, expanded the NATO solidarity and stability sphere to former so-called satellite states of the Soviet Union. Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, Slovenia, Bulgaria, Romania, the Baltic states. This is an impressive step contemporary history uh, has taken. And I'm very proud for having been a partner in this uh, process. Just imagine that four years ago, we had a NATO summit in Prague, Czech Republic. Prague and Czech Republic having been invaded 30 years before by the troops of uh, the Soviet Union and by some so-called satellite troops. We have had two years ago a summit, a NATO summit in Riga, Latvia, a Baltic state, a former part falsely integrated in the Soviet Union. We were meeting in the middle of the Soviet Union as Western Alliance. And never are we proud of these achievements, never. We are behaving as if the Soviet Union would still exist and if the Soviet Union had been the real winner of the Cold War, but it was us. In 47, when Churchill delivered a speech in Den Haag, Netherlands, when the Council of Europe was created, and when the Soviet Union prevented Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, others from joining this club of democracy and prevented these countries from drawing some benefit from the Marshall Plan, which is the real explanation for the European successes after the Second World War. Churchill was saying, the same Churchill and the one who discovered smaller nations in Zurich one year before, he was saying, we are beginning today in the West what will bring to a good end one day in the East. We are there. Churchill has won, not Stalin. And so I'm a strong believer in the strength of uh, the Northern Alliance. I do think that we really need this strong alliance between Canada, the US, and an enlarged uh, uh, Europe. I do think that it was a wise decision to invite uh, Albania and Croatia. It would have been fine for us if uh, Macedonia, I should call our rim of Iran, which is ridiculous, Macedonia, would have been invited, but you, you, you are aware of the name issue between Greece and the country, I shouldn't tell uh, Macedonia. Georgia and Ukraine are not really ready. What the president was arguing the days uh, before our uh, summit and what we were all together arguing is that, Rus that Russia shouldn't have a veto right against the membership of any other European country uh, in the NATO structures. And we made it perfectly clear to the Russians, I will have a meeting later on this month with President Putin and his successor, that they hadn't a veto. And we were making it perfectly clear that Ukraine and Georgia are on their road and on track as far as NATO membership is concerned, but they are not offered a timetable in the very same way this timetable was offered to Croatia or uh, to uh, uh, Albania. It's in the interest of all of us, of all of us to enlarge, enlarge NATO with the needed amount of intelligence and wisdom. I'm very sorry to disappoint the other students in line, but the Prime Minister must leave. Um, I'm, I've already overrun my writ. I just do want to say that the only consolation I have is that he has promised to consider perhaps at some point coming back to the University of Pittsburgh and doing a bit of teaching. So I'd like to thank him for his very, very interesting and very revealing remarks I have on to behalf say of if, the students if and faculty. If some of those who were asking had not mentioned too many times the Financial Times, time, time would have been there 
to take the other question. Thank you. <laughs>